Hi. Um, I just wanted to say thank you so much for Bergen Community College for having me here today. Um, I'm, I'm really excited and passionate to tell you about my story. I'm, I'm an artist, and I'm very passionate about being an artist. Um, I was out in the hall this morning, and I got a lot of comments about my outfit, so I just want to say that being an artist is, a, the best thing about being an artist is you always have an excuse for what you're wearing. You can always say I'm an artist. Um, although it didn't work very well for me when I was in New York City with my husband um, last October, and I think it was Halloween weekend, and I went into a store with my husband to get some mints or some gum, and someone behind the register looked up and said, are you going as the 70s? And I was like, no, I'm just going as me. So it sometimes can be a little embarrassing, but I am very passionate about being an artist. Um, I have slides. Come up. OK. Um, I'm also really passionate about being a mom. Um, I, I really felt that my kids, as they were growing up, they're both out of the home now, but as they were growing up, I really wanted to be um, passionate about what they were caring about in their lives and what they were learning about. And I found myself trying, if I could, if they were assigned a book for school um, or an assignment, that I would try to do it as well. Um, it didn't always work out, but if there was a book I could read and learn about what they were learning about, I would try to do it so I could have conversations with them about it. And their topics became more and more interesting to me. Um, both my son and my daughter got involved in the Darfur movement in high school. And I'm not here to speak specifically about that today, but that movement and learning about um, the crisis in Darfur, Sudan, really, um, it, it resonated with me, um, maybe because I grew up as a, a, a Jewish girl learning about the Holocaust, I really wanted to know more about this modern day genocide. And as, as I wanted to learn about it and be passionate about what they were learning, I started to really read and kind of grasp on and become a sponge about everything I could about Sudan. Um, if, I had, if there was a movie or a documentary or a book or an article, I just wanted to learn about it. And what I learned was that those atrocities going on were not just from that current time, but were really from decades before. And I learned a little bit um, about the Lost Boys of Sudan. Um, and um, this is Gabriel Boldeng. He's actually sitting in the audience today, and I hope you'll all stick around to hear him speak shortly, because he's incredibly inspiring. I heard he was coming to speak in my area, and it was a very snowy winter night, and I said to my daughter, let's go hear him speak. Um, Gabriel is one of the Lost Boys of Sudan, and I said, I, I'm dying to, to hear his story and to go listen to this. So we went that night, and um, I think that was a real turning point in my life. And I think why um, th th is very interesting, the reason, is that Gabriel's story resonated with me. And it wasn't necessarily because of the difficult time that he had, his escape from war, this incredible story. It was his values. It was the values that came out in this young man about his family, about education, and about his passion for learning. Um, and here I was, um, a woman in her 40s at the time, um, who had a really pretty easy life, I have to admit. I haven't, I haven't had you know, difficulties where I'm dealing with, with um, terminal illness or a loss of a child or, or all of these things that you, you hear inspirational stories from. I was just me. And I had two healthy children and just living my life and very, very lucky and appreciative of it. But what was resonating with me was that appreciation, that appreciation that he felt for his family at the age of 10. Parents that were illiterate and did not have, were not able to, to teach him to read and write, but taught him the values um, that, I was, that was resonating with me. So that night, I decided, I made a decision. I asked him, what can I do for you? And he said, I need a brick mold for my village. I want to be able to build a school. So my daughter and I looked at her. I said, I'm not going to ask any, anybody else in the family. I'm just going to do this. And I don't know if I'll ever see this man again, but I know I, from my heart that I need to do this tonight. And at the time, I was on my way to Morocco. I was going to do a painting project there. And I knew Gabriel was leaving to go to South Sudan. And I thought, good luck to him. Um, you know, well wish him. And I hope this will help. And I opened my email a few weeks into my trip, and I saw this picture um, from Gabriel. And he had told me that the villagers made over 200,000 bricks from this brick mold. And I just sat there thinking, first of all, it was a very smart move on Gabriel's part, because he reeled me in very nicely from then on in with being able to do that communication. And this topic 
today is really about communication. It's about passion and about communicating what you are passionate about and what a difference it can make. He did that with me. He communicated what had happened with that brick making machine. And I started to feel like I need to do more. I, I really want to see more happen because that little thing that I did made such a difference. Um, and this is where this turns into my story and not Gabriel's. Um, I realized that I had a connection um, to people. As a decorative artist, I was in people's homes every day, in their personal spaces, in their kitchen, in their bathrooms, in places where you talk to people. And if they don't like talking to you, you're not invited back to their house because you don't hire people in your home that you don't like having around. And I've been doing this for 20 years, and I've never advertised because I'm really good talking to people and making sure that if I do a good job when I leave and I talk to others about what I do somehow, that I will continue to get good business. And this is the same approach I took here. I started to feel like maybe if I could just tell people that I met this person, they would want to hear about it too and they would learn more about what's going on in Darfur, what happened in Sudan, and what still continues ongoing today in the South Kordofan and Blue Nile areas of, of um, the border of Sudan. So I started sort of name dropping a little bit. People had sort of heard about the Lost Boys of Sudan and I think it's, a, it's something people were interested in. It was very intriguing. So when customers, Gabriel started coming to visit the area more and more and would stay at my home and when customers would call me, I would say, um, I, can't, I can't come over and see your walls right now because I have one of the Lost Boys of Sudan in my house. And you know, I didn't need to say that, I could just say I can't come over right now. But by saying that, um, very often people would say, um, nothing, and then I would know that door is closed. But one time someone said, really? My husband just read a book called What is the What? And we really want to, we would love to have him speak at our daughter's school. And, you know, can you tell me more about that? And I realized, oh, this is a great way to get this message out, to get the message of kids here in the U.S. appreciating what they have, appreciating their education, appreciate, appreciating their teachers and, and love for family. We can have him speak to kids here in the U.S. And that way, it's doing something over there, and it's doing something over here. And right after that happened, that person who I told by name-dropping the Lost Boys of Sudan bought um, a well for the village. So my point being that by communicating this message to everyone that I spoke to, it was being able to create something more than just purchasing that original brick machine, and that's what I wanted to do. My passions were becoming really, really strong for this project, so strong that my sister said to me, I think you're having a midlife crisis, but it's a really good one. And I was like, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but you know, I also had someone else say to me, you know, I do a lot of good things too, I just don't talk about them. And I said, well, that's why I don't know what you do and I can't help. If you don't talk about them, how am I supposed to be able to help you? I'd love to hear about what you're doing. And certainly there are times where you know that the door is closed and you have to keep it closed. But to be able to speak about what you care about and what you're passionate about and let that take on a life of its own, that is what I was trying to do. But my passion for my art and my passion for this project were really very separate and it was causing a conflict with me. And I was wondering, how can I bring these two things together? And for some reason, I, I just wanted to paint a painting. It was quite a few summers ago. Um, I took out my, my paints and I wanted to paint a painting about what I was feeling. And um, there was a photograph of women in Gabriel's village and I was very, the women were resonating with me. Um, the strength of them, their beauty, um, their humanness, their, their, their pure joy in this picture of seeing um, their, their long lost son return to their village and I painted it. And when I was done, I looked at it and I said, you know what, this is a powerful tool. This is advocacy. This is something that I can use to show others to tell the story and I've really brought my two passions together. And maybe I could tell other people, other artists, to do the same, to learn about this crisis through, and to tell about it through their art. So this idea got in my head and I started calling some people and just passing it by them saying, what do you think about this? Some, a couple of artists that were connected with artisans groups, and I said, would it be okay if I came and spoke to your artisans group about what I'm learning about what's happening in Sudan and about um, my friend and his project in South Sudan? And they said, sure, you can come talk about it. They're probably just gonna keep painting what they're doing, but I'm sure you, know, you can get five minutes. So I went to this meeting. Um, there were probably 15 artists in the room and I had five minutes time. And I didn't know any of them. They'd never heard about the Lost Boys of Sudan and they never heard about me. And I said to them, 
this is what I'm passionate about, this is what I'm doing, I want all of you to paint about this crisis, and I want all of you to, to also paint about these beautiful women in this country who are, have been um, marginalized and people that have been dehumanized at different parts of, of their life and different parts of the country. Will you do this with me? And I said, how many of you in this room will, will do this? And every hand shot up. And then I said, how many of you in this room would be on a committee with me to turn this into a really big event and exposure that we can kind of get the whole community to come to? And I got my committee of, of people in that meeting. And what happened was I realized people want something, artists wanted something to be able to paint about. They wanted to be able to do something good. And even though none of them knew about the situation, it gave them the, the passion to go to read about it, to learn about it, and whatever inspired them, whether it was this beautiful painting that came in of the strong, incredible um, sense of um, humanness in this woman that came in, or this photo of a refugee in Darfur that, I mean, if you, if you cannot look into the eyes of that painting and not feel something, then I don't, I don't really know, you know what's going on inside you. Because this, to me, this came from someone who had not read about it, had not learned about it. So I was getting more and more paintings that started to come in from different people that I didn't even know. And so I went to a national conference that I go to every year. The artists in this conference, all we've ever talked about is what medium we're using, what color, um, what fabric. We've never talked about breast cancer or, you know, crisis or anything going on in the world. We just talk about art. And I came with this crazy idea. I said, give me a booth. I want to put up these paintings that, that, I'm, that I'm having people learn about, um, South, South Sudan and Sudan, and they, and they did. And more and more paintings started to come in, and people started to get in, really interested. This one came in from um, Massachusetts, and I, I still have yet to meet the artist, but I, I just couldn't believe how, how this painting worked for advocacy, for telling the story. It did everything that I was trying to do in this big painting. And we've had exhibits where we've put this up. Um, recently, we had an exhibit where one of the um, participants, one of the volunteers, said, I you know, moved this painting from the front of the room and put it in the back. And I said, what are you doing? And they said, well, we don't want to turn people off when they come in the door. Let's put one of these beautiful paintings up front. And I, I said, well, actually, I want to put that back in the front because to me, this is what we, people need to see what's happening. This is so that people will know the story, will understand, will stand there and read and look. It's easy to look at the, the beautiful things. It's hard to look at things that are difficult. Um, this is a painting of a refugee um, girl and shows the sweat and hardship in the refugee camp in, in Yida, South Sudan. Um, this, again, came from another artist. So I was learning the more, the more I spread and talked about it, the more artists were, were getting inspired to do this and were learning about it. So there were a few missions to the project. My initial mission was to tell the story to people on the outside and to have artists learn about it and create sort of these soldiers of peace out there with the other artists. At the same time, I was really caring about the women and believing that the women in the village were really um, key to the sustainability of the work we were doing in South Sudan. So the money that was raised, that would be raised from selling these, would go to that project. But getting back to what I was talking about, about talking about things, my daughter did an art project a semester in Barcelona last fall. She just picked up and left school. It wasn't part of school. I didn't really understand what she was doing, but she just had had enough for the moment and went off to Barcelona. And I, I said, you know what, I'm going to go visit her. And when I was there, now not even realizing that I was doing this or intentionally going to talk about this project, I guess I had brought it up. Well, what do you know? It had come up with one of the art teachers there, one of her art teachers. And then I left and came home and Right after I was home, about a month later, I got, a, I got an email from this art teacher that said, we in here in Barcelona want to do a canvas piece project here. So on May 11th, in a couple weeks, we have 10 countries represented that will be painting um, paintings about um, what's going on in Sudan and supporting the project in South Sudan. Um, this is another great story, a young artist in school who contacted me, she found out about the project and said, can I meet you with my painting? I met her on the side of the road and she had painted this beautiful painting of, of the um, refugees in, in Darfur and just handed it off to me. I never saw, I haven't seen her again. 
but this painting was exhibited and sold and helped to benefit. So, you know, by, by spreading this passion and by having each artist now spread the passion, I know that all of these different people out there that are working on the project have become their own separate advocates for it. And, and keeping that inside and just buying that one brick mold and having just walked away from that, it would have been a nice gesture, but it would never have, have snowballed into this. And, and so that's really my message, is that you don't know what's going to happen when you take that one more step. And one of the things that I always tell my kids is, you know, if you read something or you, or you something moves you, you see something, you know, you see something on television, if you just do one little thing, even if it's just telling a friend, then you just don't know where it's going to take you. So these are, this is an artist here who, again, had not, I had not known her, she was not part of a group of friends, had done a part of this project and was then part of hanging the exhibit and being part of the committee to have this exhibit run in our community. Um, and, and I live in an affluent area of Fairfield County, Connecticut. People don't come out that easily for things, um, you know, unless they're, it's an exciting evening. Um, we had a very, very large crowd. We did a lot of advocacy work in the community, um, through the library, through um, local community centers, through cultural diversity clubs and schools. And what was amazing to me is that people came out to learn and they were reading about the topic. And they weren't just reading about it, they were bidding on these paintings to actually buy them and hang them in their homes. And in that way, creating a whole other level of advocacy because by hanging them in their homes, when their friends came to visit and ask, what is this painting, where did you get it, what does it mean, they then are going to be another person telling the story. I had the wonderful opportunity to travel to the village in South Sudan last year, and um, this picture just, I mean, I, I could show you 100 pictures, but this one picture of this face says so much. This is the humanizing. These are the people that, that were helping, whether you're helping someone in your own community, someone that means something to you. Everybody is a human being that, that really deserves the attention and the love that we can give them. And going and seeing the faces and seeing how resilient they are really moved me to continue this work. When I went, um, a lot of my friends said to me, oh, you're, you're, you're going to go there and you're going to come back and it's gonna, you're just going to be a different person and it's going to be so hard and how are you going to go on and after you see this? And, and you know what? I went there and I came back so humbled, so, so incredibly humbled by the incredible strength of, of the people and the women and the children who literally, I mean, they have what Gabriel described in that first that first meeting with him that, that resonated with me, they have the love of each other and they have nothing material and they have very little food. And, and the love and the, the, um, the strength is humbling. And I came back and it changed my life. So, uh, you know, basically what I, want is, what I want to say is Gabriel always says to me, he always says, how come you do so much for me? How, why do you do it? And I say, no, you do so much for me. People that help are being helped themselves. You feel like you're doing something for someone else. This, this is something that you do for yourself. And my being with these incredibly strong women has changed my life. I hope you'll find something that will do that for you as well. Thank you so much.